midnight. Completely exhausted. Surely it's not normal to be revising before a date as if it were a job interview. Suspect Daniel's enormously well-read brain may turn out to be something of a nuisance if things develop. Since leaving work, I have nearly slipped a disc wheezing through a step aerobics class, scratched my naked body for seven minutes with a stiff brush, cleaned the flat, filled the fridge, plucked my eyebrows, skimmed the papers and the ultimate sex guide, put the washing in and waxed my own legs since it was too late to book an appointment. Ended up kneeling on a towel trying to pull off a wax strip firmly stuck to the back of my calf while watching Newsnight in an effort to drum up some interesting opinions about things. Wise people will say Daniel should like me just as I am. But I am a child of cosmopolitan culture, have been traumatised by supermodels and too many quizzes, and know that neither my personality nor my body is up to it if left to its own devices. Saturday, 25th of February, 6pm. Oh, joy! Have spent the day in a state I can only describe as shag drunkenness, mooning about the flat, smiling, picking things up and putting them down again. Oh, it was so lovely. The only down points were, one, immediately it was over, Daniel said, damn, I meant to take the car into the Citroen garage. And two, when I got up to go to the bathroom, he pointed out that I had a pair of tights stuck to the back of my calf. But as the rosy clouds begin to disperse, I begin to feel alarm. What now? 11pm. Oh, God. Why hasn't Daniel rung? Are we going out now or what? March. Saturday, 4th of March. I am so depressed. Daniel, though flirty all week, has given me no hint as to what is going on between us, as though it is perfectly normal to sleep with one of your colleagues and then just leave it at that. At 4.15 on Friday evening, Sharon rang me in the office. Are you coming out with me and Jude tomorrow? Um, I silently panicked, thinking, surely Daniel will ask to see me this weekend before he leaves the office. Call me if he doesn't ask, said Sharon dryly after a pause. At 5.45, saw Daniel with his coat on heading out of the door. My traumatised expression must have shamed even him, because he smiled shiftily nodded at the computer screen and shot out. Sure enough, message pending was flashing. Message Jones. Have a good weekend. Pip, pip, cleave. Miserably, I picked up the phone and dialed Sharon. What time are we meeting tomorrow? I mumbled sheepishly. 8.30. Café Rouge. Don't worry, we love you. 2 a.m. I had a real relief with Chaz and Jude. Daniel's stupid prat. Feels sicky, though. <gasps> Oops. Sunday, 5th of March, 8am. Wish was dead. I'm never, ever going to drink again for the rest of life. 11.30am. Badly need water, but seems better to keep eyes closed and head stationary on pillow so as not to disturb bits of machinery and pheasants in head. Noon. Bloody good fun, but V-confused, re-advice, re-Daniel. Had to go through Jude's problems with Val Richard first, as clearly they are more serious, since they have been going out for 18 months rather than just shagged once. I waited humbly, therefore, till it was my turn to recount the latest Daniel instalment. The unanimous initial verdict was bastard fuckwittage. Interestingly, however, Jude introduced the concept of boy time, as introduced in the film Clueless, namely five days, seven, I interjected, during which new relationship is left hanging in air after sex does not seem agonising lifetime to males of species, but a normal cooling down period in which to gather emotions before proceeding. Anyway, going to have another little sleep. 2pm. Story in papers about two-year-olds having to take tests to get into nursery school just made me jump out of my skin. Oh, I'm supposed to be at a tea party for Godson Harry's birthday. 
6pm. Drove at breakneck speed, feeling like I was dying across grey, rain-sodden London to Magda's, stopping at Waterstones for birthday gifts. Magda, once a commodity broker, lies about Harry's age now to make him seem more advanced than he is. Even the conception was cutthroat, with Magda trying to take eight times as much folic acid and minerals as anyone else. The birth was great. She'd been telling everyone for months it was going to be a natural childbirth, and ten minutes in, she cracked and started yelling, Give me the drugs, you fat cow! Tea party was nightmare scenario. Me plus a room full of power mothers, one of whom had a four-week-old baby. Oh, isn't she sweet? cooed Sarah Delisle, then snapped. How did he do in his Apgar? This Apgar is a test they have to do at two minutes. Magda embarrassed herself two years ago by boasting at a dinner party that Harry got ten in his, at which one of the other guests, who happens to be a nurse, pointed out that the Apgar test only goes up to nine. Thought Head was going to burst with the racket. Eventually made my excuses and drove home, congratulating myself on being single. Called Tom to report the hideous news that Daniel had not rung all weekend. Tom said I should not flirt, not lecture, but merely be an aloof, coolly professional ice queen. Men, he claims, view themselves as permanently on some sort of sexual ladder with all women, either above them or below them. If the woman is below, i.e. willing to sleep with him, then in a Groucho Marx kind of way, he does not want to be a member of her club. This whole mentality depresses me enormously. But Tom said not to be naive, and if I really love Daniel and want to win his heart, I have to ignore him and be as cold and distant to him as possible. Monday, 6th of March. Can officially confirm that the way to a man's heart these days is not through beauty, food, sex, or alluringness of character, but merely the ability to seem not very interested in him. Took no notice of Daniel whatsoever all day at work and pretended to be busy. Try not to laugh. Eventually, when Perpetua was out, he walked past my desk, stopped for a moment and murmured, Jones, you gorgeous creature. Why are you ignoring me? The heavens were smiling on me and the phone rang. I rolled my eyes apologetically, picked it up. Then Perpetua bustled up, knocking a pile of proofs off the desk with her bottom and bellowed, Ah, Daniel, now. And swept him away, which was fortunate because the phone call was Tom, who said I had to keep up the Ice Queen Act and gave me a mantra to repeat whenever I felt myself weakening. Aloof, unavailable Ice Queen. Aloof, unavailable Ice Queen. Wednesday, 15th of March. Hmm. Have woken up V fed up. On top of everything, only two weeks to go until birthday when we'll have to face up to the fact that another entire year has gone by, during which everyone else except me has mutated into smug married, having children plop, 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 left, right and centre, and making hundreds of thousands of pounds and inroads into very hub of establishment, while I career rudderless and boyfriendless through dysfunctional relationships and professional stagnation. Also worried about how to celebrate birthday. Size of flat and bank balance prohibits actual party. Maybe dinner party? Could all go out for meal, but then feel guilty asking everyone to pay, selfishly presuming to force costly and dull evening on others merely to celebrate own birthday. Oh, God, what to do? Friday, 17th of March. Have decided we'll have dinner party. Just call Tom, who says, very wisely... It is your birthday and you should invite exactly and only who you want. So, I'm just going to ask the following. Sharon, Jude, Tom, Magda and Jeremy. Call Tom back to tell him the plan and he said, And Jerome? What? And Jerome? I thought, like we said, i just ask who I... I tailed off, realising if I said wanted... It would mean I didn't want, i.e. like, Tom's insufferable pretentious boyfriend. Oh, I said, overcompensating madly. You mean you're Jerome? Uh, of course Jerome's invited, you ninny. Ugh. But do you think it's OK not to ask Jude's vile Richard? And Woney? 
even though she had me to her birthday last week? She'll never know. When I told Jude who was coming, she said perkily, Oh, so we're bringing other halves, which means vile Richard. Next thing, Sharon rang. I hope I haven't put my foot in it. I just saw Rebecca and asked her if she was coming to your birthday and she looked really offended. Oh, no. I'll have to ask Rebecca and Martin crashing bore now. But that means I'll have to ask Joanna as well. Shit, shit. Now I've said I'm cooking, I can't suddenly announce we're going out to a restaurant or I'll seem both idle and mean. Oh, God. Just got home to icy, offended-sounding answer phone message from Woni. Cosmo and I were wondering what you'd like for your birthday this year. Would you call us back, please? Realise I'm going to spend my birthday cooking food for 16 people. Saturday, 18th of March. 2pm. Hmm. Just what I needed. My mother burst into my flat. Guess what, darling? She said, dropping her eyes modestly, then looking up, beaming like Bonnie Langford about to embark upon a tap-dancing routine. What? I muttered grumpily. I've got a job as a TV presenter. Sunday, 19th of March. Hooray! Whole new positive perspective on birthday. I've been talking to Jude about books she has been reading, about festivals and rites of passage in primitive cultures, and I'm feeling happy and serene. Realise it is shallow and wrong to feel that flat is too small to entertain 16, and that cannot be asked to spend birthday cooking, and would rather dress up and be taken to posh restaurant by sex god with enormous gold credit card. Instead, I'm going to think of my friends as a huge, warm African, or possibly Turkish, family. These 16 people are my friends. They want to be welcomed into my home to celebrate with affection and simple homely fare, not to judge. I'm going to cook shepherd's pie for them all. It will be a marvellous, warm, third-world-style ethnic family party. Monday, 20th of March. I've decided to serve the shepherd's pie with char-grilled Belgian endive salad, roquefort lardon and frizzled chorizo to add a fashionable touch. Have not tried before, but sure it will be easy. Followed by individual Grand Marnier soufflés. Tuesday, 21st of March. Birthday. 6.30pm. Cannot go on. I've just stepped in a pan of mashed potato, forgetting that kitchen floor and surfaces were covered in pounds of mince and mashed potato. It is already 6.30 and have to go out to Cullen's for Grand Marnier souffle ingredients and other forgotten items. Oh, my God. Suddenly remembered tube of contraceptive jelly might be on side of wash basin. Must hide it. 7.35pm. Oh, my God! Just looked for milk and realised I've left the carrier bag behind in the shop. That means... Oh, God! And the olive oil! So I cannot do frizzy salad thing. 7.40pm. Hmm. <laughs> Best plan, surely, is to get into the bath with a glass of champagne, then get ready. At least if I look nice, I can carry on cooking when everyone is here and maybe can get Tom to go out for the missing ingredients. 7.55pm. Doorbell. I'm in bra and pants with wet hair. Suddenly hate the guests. I've had to slay for two days and now they will all swan in demanding food like cuckoos. Feel like opening door and shouting, Oh, go fuck yourselves. 2am. Feeling V-emotional. At door were Magda. Tom, Sharon and Jude with bottle of champagne. They said to hurry up and get ready and when I had dried hair and dressed, they had cleaned up all the kitchen and thrown away the shepherd's pie. It turned out Magda had booked a big table at 192 and told everyone to go there instead of my flat. And there they all were, waiting with presents, planning to buy me dinner. Love the friends. Better than extended Turkish family in weird headscarves any day. April. Sunday, 2nd of April. I read in an article that Kathleen Tynan, late wife of the late Kenneth, had inner poise and, when writing, was to be found immaculately dressed, sitting at a small table in the centre of the room, sipping at a glass of chilled white wine. Kathleen Tynan would not when late with a press release for Perpetua, lie fully dressed and terrified under the duvet, chain-smoking, glogging cold sake out of a beaker and putting on makeup as a hysterical displacement activity. 
Kathleen Tynan would not allow Daniel to sleep with her whenever he felt like it, but not be her boyfriend. Nor would she become insensible with drink and be sick. Wished to be like Kathleen Tynan, though not, obviously, dead. In a poise. No fags for six days now. Have assumed air of dignified auteur with Daniel and not messaged, flirted or slept with him for three weeks. Only three alcohol units consumed over the last week as grudging concession to Tom, who complained that spending the evening with the new vice-free me was like going out for dinner with a whelk, scallop or other flaccid sea creature. My body is a temple. I wonder if it's time to go to bed yet. Oh no, it's only 8.30. Ooh, telephone. 9pm. It was my father speaking in a weird, disconnected voice. Bridget, turn your television set to BBC One. I switched channels and lurched in horror. It was a trailer for the Anna Nick show, and there, between Anna and Nick on the sofa, was my mother, all boofed and made up as if she were Katie Bloody Boyle or someone. And we'll be introducing our new springtime slot, said Nick. Suddenly single. A dilemma being faced by a growing number of women. Anne. And introducing spanking new presenter Pam Jones, said Anne. Suddenly single herself and making her TV debut. Wednesday, 5th of April. Told you today about the inner poise thing and she said, interestingly, that she'd been reading a self-help book about Zen. She said that it was all a question of flow rather than struggle. And if... For example, you had a problem or things were not working out. Instead of straining or becoming angry, you should just relax and feel your way into the flow and everything would work out. But not to mention idea to Sharon because she thought it was bollocks. Thursday, 6th of April. Went to meet Jude for a quiet drink to talk about flow some more and noticed a familiar besuited figure with knitting pattern, dark good looks, sitting in a quiet corner, having dinner. It was mad as Jeremy. Waved at him, and just for split seconds saw expression of horror cross his face, which instantly made me look to his companion, who was A. Not Magda, and B. Not Yet Thirty. I could tell Jeremy was going to try to get away with a sort of quick... Hello, not now, look, which acknowledges your close, old and enduring friendship, but at the same time demonstrates that this is not the moment to affirm it with kisses and an in-depth chat. I was about to play along with it, but then I thought, hang on a minute. Sisters, under the skin, Magda. I altered my path to pass his table at which he immersed himself deep in conversation with the trollop, glancing up as I walked past and giving me a firm, confident smile as if to say, business meeting. What should I do now, though? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Tell Magda? Not tell Magda? Mind my own business? Remembering Zen, Kathleen Tynan and Inner Poise, I centred myself, concentrating on the inner wheel till the flow came. Then I resolved serenely to tell no one, as gossip is a virulent, spreading poison. Tuesday, 11th of April. All seems normal with Magda and Jeremy, so maybe it was just a business meeting. I'm invited to a glittering, literati launch of Kafka's motorbike next week at the Ivy. Determined, I'm going to improve social skills, confidence and make parties work for me as guided by article have just read in magazine. Apparently, Tina Brown of the New Yorker is brilliant at dealing with parties, gliding effortlessly from group to group, saying, Martin Amis, Nelson Mandela, Richard Gere, in a tone which at once suggests, My God, I have never been more enchanted to see anyone in my entire life. Wished to be like Tina Brown, though not, obviously, quite so hard-working. The article is full of useful tips. When introducing people, add a thoughtful detail or two about each person so that their interlocutor has a conversational kicking-off point. E.g. This is Gina. She's a keen skydiver and lives on a barge. 